according to my survey, the loosest professional grinders in Vegas are folding before the flop 70% of the time. We've been playing poker since the first great books were written. And back then, the mantra was, tight is right. That's and, right. And now those were the days before no limit and pot limit and all that. And right. so now it's a whole different world because it's possible to play a much higher VPIP and still make a living. That's right. And the other thing that's happened since our earliest days in the game was people have gotten a lot smarter about the game. Right. The tools that have True. become available are astonishing, would yeah. have been unthinkable in the days right. that we first started playing. And so people have learned so much more about the game. Everything, the, the software. And, right. and all that has pushed the boundaries mm -hmm. yeah. because for a long time, we would be in situations where nobody really knew. There wasn't enough data. Right. Like all we had was our gut sense of what felt like a lot of hands to us. Mm -hmm. But even in the time that you and I have been playing poker, you know, in the literally <laughs> decades that right. we've been playing poker, when we first started discussing whether it was correct to do this thing or that thing, we had maybe thousands of hands behind us or tens mm -hmm. of thousands right. of hands. Then online poker happened. People had hundreds of thousands and millions of hands yeah. to review. And then the, the game theory software and the solvers and the AIs got involved mm -hmm. and they were literally playing trillions of hands against each other. Right. So their ability right. to find the line between plus EV and minus right. EV yeah. has and, become that much more accurate. And that in itself has actually been a problem for me and some of my clients in that, in that you find these lines based on AI and data that say this is plus EV, this is minus EV, but it's only by a small amount. That's right. And so you have a lot of people playing many plays that are very close to break even, mm -hmm. right? And and there's other gray areas involved that make it, you know, you can't be certain if it's positive against those players at that time. Right. You know, so that brings me to the issue of like, okay, so what do we do? You know, how tight do we play or how loose do we play? For me, as with everything, it's influenced by position. I feel I can play more rigidly tight and adhere to my own rules when I know I'm going to be out of position on that hand, mm -hmm. for example, from the small blind, right. where I'm always going to be out of position. And, and so what I do is I've, I've structured my out of position game to be somewhat rigid and then I have certain ranges of hands that I always fold in certain situations no matter right, what. Right, that's what you call your auto fold range. Auto fold range. We're going to be hearing a lot more about those as the videos go on. But, and then in the back end, when it, on the button in the cutoff, mm -hmm. uh, that's when I expand my range considerably and I have a, a wide it depends range. Right. So, so I'm definitely not tight in those situations. Mm -hmm. I'm capable of being very tight but also capable of really, you know, being rather daring and bold in those situations. Right. So my general answer to is tight still right? It, I believe it's still right to play basically as tight as you can stand it when you know you're going to be out of position. Right. And otherwise, play the situation and open it up and zig and zag. I am a risk-averse human being. Uh -huh. As the viewers go, no, really. <laughs> but, but seriously, I am, I am very risk-averse. Uh -huh. And so tightness is just a comforting, easy yeah. place for me. And I am fully willing to acknowledge that I am probably giving up mm -hmm. some EV in various places because it is true, it is provably true that the smaller the EV, the higher the variance is going right. to be. Right. So you give up the 5248s, and what you gain is less variance. That's right. And peace of mind. And that's exactly correct. I'm yeah. giving up the 5248s just yeah. because I don't want to navigate those choppy waters. Right. And you can't be so sure that you are 5248. That's the other thing about those, right. is it's hazy. In there. Exactly. Yeah. If it is 5248, then you're not, you can't be 100% sure right. that it's not 4852. Right. But if you're in a situation where you think it's 7030 and you and you guessed wrong and it was only 6535, you're still in pretty good shape. <laughs> you're still in great shape, right? <laughs> so one of the things that I know you like to talk about is tightness as a safe haven 
Yeah. After, you know, when when your brain may not be in its best place. Do you want right. to talk about well, that? All along, I realized that um, anytime I played tighter than I was playing, I always did better. You know, I would, I would oscillate between playing really tight, getting a lot of bluffing equity, everything's going great, then I would abuse it a little bit, and then abuse it a little bit more, and then lose. And this could be in the course of an hour or a week or a month or whatever, and then eventually come back to tightness. And then after a couple decades of that, I got tired of it about 10 years ago, and I decided I'm just going to fold certain hands in cer certain situations no matter what. Mm -hmm. So even if I'm stuck in steaming and everything, I'll have this safety net where I'm never going to get too loose right. according to my own rules before the flop. That's all we're mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. So that's been a huge savior for me. And it's like you said, it gives me great security now that I've trained myself over the last 10 years to stick to my auto fold ranges, uh, it gives me great security to know that if I lose two, two outers in a row mm -hmm. and I pick up, let's say, ace jack suited under the gun, mm -hmm. I know I'm going to fold it. Right. Now, it doesn't matter if I should fold it according to somebody else's theory. Mm -hmm. According to me, I want to fold that hand. Right. So Every again, time. and that's, I think that's a very important thing. Like this is Tommy that ace jack suited does not make Tommy's cut. Under the gun in a Under full Under the game, gun ever. in a full game, ace jack suited right. does not make the cut. That doesn't mean that Tommy's saying, or I'm saying, ace jack suited, you may not play it. I'm, right. But what you're saying is, that is your, that's your fence. And as long as you stay inside that fence, mm -hmm. you feel safe and comfortable. One thing I would like to bring that to is for new or infrequent players. Maybe you don't get a chance to play a lot of poker. Maybe you don't live in a casino town. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe you have a job or you know, spouse, kids, whatever, whatever those things are that you know that take up from a your, life. Yeah, a, a <laughs> IRL that, that actually takes up away from your poker time. But the point is, is that it can be very tempting if you say, "Well, I only have." four hours this week to play poker, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, then, yeah. Yeah. you know, I don't want to fold. That's, I want to play poker. Yeah, it's, it's a tough one. Um, somehow you have to get to where you actually enjoy folding, that you take pride and joy in the act of throwing the hands away that you used to play. Right. And that is a toughie. The, the, the hard thing about that is, you know, the catch-22 of amateur players is, it takes a lot of hours in sequence, week after week, mm -hmm. to build these kind of discipline muscles. Now let's switch the angle a little bit on the camera and talk about people who do play for a living, because I know you have some interesting thoughts about professional players mm -hmm. and how tight they play. Well, I took a survey. Uh, of, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> we have data, people. <laughs> the survey says, yeah. So I have a handful of friends that are uh, grinders in Vegas that play one two, one three, two five primarily, some five ten, but mm -hmm. but essentially two five players, grinding out a living for years. So I posed this question to them. I said, um, "What is the tightest and loosest a professional can play in Vegas and make a living?" And by tight and loose, I'm talking about BPIP, before the flop. How, how often on a percentage basis do the grinders in Vegas voluntarily put money in the pot right. before the flop? Okay. And the tightest any of these people think anybody could play mm -hmm. and make a living is 15 to 17% BPIP. Okay. okay. And that's across all the hands they All play. hands. Okay, not right. under the gun, button, everything averaged out. Right. So that means this person's playing like 7% ish under the gun which mm -hmm. is happens to be about my range mm -hmm. and then up to like 25 ish 30 on the button or whatever they could average out to 15 percent okay right but the loose one right this is the number <laughs> we're all waiting for was 30 percent okay so what this means is that according to my survey and this mm -hmm. also is in line with my own opinion the loosest professional grinders in vegas are folding before the flop 70 percent of the time Whether that qualifies as tight, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think to most recreational players, if you actually did fold 70% of your hands, you know, for a year, you would you would feel like a tight player. Oh, yes. And, yes, you and would. And the other people at the table would start calling you a tight player. 
And uh, they might resent you a little bit. Yeah. Um, which is what loose players do. Well, so I want to. I want to. There's I, another I topic. Bring, yeah, there's, please. I'll bring it up right here. Uh, yeah, nits. Can we talk about nits? You hear the expression, and it is. It means somebody who the the rest of the table, the rest of the poker community, perceives as. I guess we could say overtight. I think. I think it. It's fun to define nit because it's 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 a perception thing. Mm -hmm. You could say that to. To loose player named Joe, his definition of a nit is somebody that plays tighter than he does. That's, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Right. Right. But I mean, it's really interesting because some of our, some of our favorite content producers use phrases like, nobody likes a nit. Lee, Tommy, I know I've told you this before, but nobody likes a nit. And you'll hear that said. Uh -huh. And then some of us are like, Okay, but maybe I am a nit, and yeah. You well, know. I'm a. I've always been very proud to be a nit because, to me, the word nit is just the next word in our lexicon that came after rock. <laughs> right. And the word rock back when we played was was the badge of honor. Mm -hmm. It's like if you went to a casino and you're getting a scouting report on the game, and your buddy says, you know, watch out for seats three and six. They're rocks. Mm -hmm. What they meant was they're steady, they're solid. They don't get in the way. They're just, they're like part of the rake, right? <laughs> I mean, it was like, they're part it, of was the rake. A, it wow. was truly an honor to be called a rock, right? Then in the early days of using the word knit, it mm -hmm. meant tight, mm -hmm. but it didn't have a negative connotation. Right. It just meant tight, right? And it also implied that you were nitty maybe with your tipping. And, and, your, and, and maybe and, and uncreative would be another... You know, Maybe, Maybe some of that. But right. that's the thing. See, gradually over time, and then over the last five or ten years, now the word has, has a negative connotation to it that goes far, far beyond VPIP. But <clears throat> one of the reasons they don't like nits is because yeah. the nits take the money out of the game. Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it, people, but that's, right. that is the truth. There's creative nits like me, and then there are uncreative nits who can who will do well in, in soft games. Right. You know, the uncreative nits who are, aren't going to do well in a table of pros. But in, in loose, low-limit games, it's certainly possible for a very, very tight nit who doesn't necessarily play a very creative game mm -hmm. to take money out of the game regularly. And that can agitate everybody. It <laughs> agitates the loose players, and it agitates the the thinking pros because mm -hmm. it's like, wow, they, they don't deserve <laughs> they don't deserve that money they didn't do right. any earn it. I see players who have what I call a see the flop range. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and they have some sense in their head of hands that want to see the flop. Right. So if you see the under the gun player raise, well, you can't just have a hand and you say, oh, well, my, you know, my seven six suited wants to see a flop. Right. Let's say you're next behind him. You're next example. behind right. him, right? In middle position. In yeah. middle position. Yeah. You can't just say, oh, seven, six suited is in my see the flop range. Mm -hmm. And now I just want to find out how much it costs me to get to the, the flop. You know, let's say we're playing a 1-3 game. And there's been a raise to $15. But the guy over here hasn't seen it. And so he just, he puts out his $3 right. and the dealer says, oh, I'm sorry, sir. There was a raise of 15. Right. It goes, and oh, and, and then he puts out his three nickels instead. Right. right. And you're like, well, if your hand was just worth yeah. limping in before the flop, what makes you think it, it's okay to pay $15 right. to see the flop with it now? That's a good point. Right. So again, when the price of the ticket to the flop goes up, yeah. the quality of hands that you're taking to the flop need right. to go up with it. Back to the question that is the title of this episode. Is tight still right? And your answer? And my answer is I have yet to have a client of mine who has an already a established working pro who score would not definitely go up if they did absolutely nothing but fold more hands before the flop. Now, there's two types of folding hands before the flop. There's when you're on your A game 
and you've decided, okay, these are the hands I should fold in these situations. Right. Okay, so yeah. that's one thing you gotta sure. decide is theoretically, mm -hmm. what hands do you think you should be folding before the flop all the time? Right. And then the other part of it, and this is the real reason why most amateur players would do better by just lowering their VPIP, and that is because everybody tilts at some point, and the first sign of tilt is just playing too many hands. Right. So that's another area where seeing fewer flops is gonna make you more money. I really believe just what you're saying, that basically every player I know, including myself, would lose less or win more mm -hmm. if they just saw fewer flops. Right. You take all the situations that you think are close mm -hmm. or bad right. <laughs> right. and just fold those. And you're just trimming off the highest fluctuation situations. That's basically. right. If you just trim off those marginal hands, uh -huh. I think right. we both believe right. that your results will improve. So, like every content creator ever on YouTube, mm -hmm. there's a couple of requests we have for you. If you enjoy what you see, if you appreciate what we're doing here, please do click the like button wherever you see it below here. And we'd love it if you'd click the subscribe button. Speaking of video creators, I would like this time to say thank you to all the video content creators who have preceded us mm -hmm. and who are making content alongside of us. And they do it for free, basically. And they've brought us so much education and so much entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say to them, thank you.